Okay, so final video, I think, unless it takes too long, on resource extraction. So remember, we started off with this limits to growth model, and it just said, according to that model, we're just going to race to the cliff and then fall over the edge of it and collapse. The economy will collapse. But one of the key things that model was missing was a model for how the price of natural resources is actually determined and there's this thing called scarcity rent which actually hoteling wrote about in the 30s and the thing is as we start approaching the edge of the cliff the scarcity rent rises the price of the resource will rise the rate of use will fall and that um, is what we see in the model that I showed you the full model. We saw models which sort of capture the separate elements and then we put it all together in a full model. But for most resources that we see today, we're still in this phase of more or less constant price and steeply rising extraction. We can actually parameterize this model and using like geological data and so on, estimate extraction paths or likely or possible extraction paths for different minerals and so on. I did that in the 2016 paper for copper and I think it's a while since I looked at it but two or three it's a sort of two or three hundred year times time scale before we really start looking at uh, drastically significantly reduced extraction rates. The Earth's crust is a hell of a big place and there's just a lot of these minerals out there. Okay, so that's kind of the good news if you want to see continued rapid growth. It's the bad news if you're hoping that resource scarcity will somehow slow down the sort of runaway train of the global economy. Okay. So what have we got in the slides? We can solve the problems related to resource stocks, extraction costs, and predictions about the price. We can solve the problems related to resource scarcity. So we can build models. We can see how, what, as the resource starts to run out, the price will go up steeply and so on. But what about the demand side? On the demand side, we've the whole time we've just assumed Cobb Douglas, right? We've just assumed a Cobb Douglas function for the demand side, which means that when the price of the resource doubles, the resource flow will halve, for instance. Do we have any support for that? Of course, when we look at the data, we see constant factor shares, which is what the Cobb Douglas gives us, right? Let's see. Yeah, here the factor share of metals is staying constant, and here the factor share of energy is more or less staying constant. So it's not an unreasonable choice, but if we want to be more confident about what is going to happen in the long run, we really need to unpack this Cobb Douglas function, right? We want to really know a bit more what is really going on on the demand side. Because remember here, up till now, resource use has been growing steeply, tracking growth in GDP. But we're saying that at some point it has to go down. Can we really be confident in this Cobb Douglas that, oh, it'll be fine when it does have to go down? To have any confidence, we really need to unpack that Cobb Douglas function and work out what's really going on there. Okay, I'm just going to pause here. Right, so let's have a look at some literature. And this is um, Herman Daly, an ecological economist and a strident critic of the Solo Stiglitz or the DHSS model. And he says, in the Solo Stiglitz variant, to make a cake, we need not only the cook in his kitchen, but also some non-zero amount of flour, sugar, eggs, etc. So in the um, basic neoclassical model, 
there's no resources, right? We only need the kitchen and the cook, labor and capital. But now we need resources. This seems like a great step forward until we realize that we could make our cake a thousand times bigger with no extra ingredients if we would simply stir faster and use bigger bowls and ovens. So we think, what is Daly saying here? He's looking here and he's looking at this Cobb Douglas function. I'll set this capital in there too. So this is like, let's go one minus alpha minus beta K to the alpha R to the beta. Okay. And he's saying, okay, if R goes down, oh no, we can make a thousand times more product Y with the same R if we just raise K and L and maybe A. Okay, for cake, that's not reasonable, but is it reasonable for value, right? The GDP is like dollars per year, the value of what we produce. Is it reasonable that we can raise the value of what we produce by without needing more resources. The way that the DHSS model in the in original model, productivity is constant and you compensate for R going down by K going up. So if you think of cake, you have fewer ingredients, but you compensate by getting more ovens and spoons and stuff. Okay, <laughs> it makes no sense. And that model really doesn't make sense like I talked about before with the depreciation and so on. Instead, we need a model with AY going up or the productivity, labor productivity goes up. But can that really compensate for declines in R? How would it do that? That's what we need to think more about. Okay, and the DHSS model does not give us those answers. We want to unpack how that might work and try and get some evidence. This is super important, right? To understand and get a grip on sustainability for the future. So how can we save on flour, sugar, and eggs? We can reduce waste in the production process. Okay, so we can get more efficient in the use of flour, sugar, and eggs. We could make our cake with almond flour and bananas, <laughs> okay. So we could use other inputs instead and still make cake. If the flour, sugar, and eggs are running out, maybe we can find some other ingredients. Or we could just eat less cake and make more other stuff instead. We could shift the pattern of our production and consumption three different ways we could adapt to save on flour, sugar, and eggs. None of those really show up in this basic, in the sort of DHSS model, right? They're all sort of, you could argue that, well, somehow the f kind of flexibility in those three mechanisms is why we have the flexibility that we see in the Cobb-Douglas function. But that's not very satisfactory, is it? We want to really know what's going on like which of these three is important how do they work what is this potential for the future we need to unpack that okay ironically <laughs> solo one of the the s's in the dhss the year before he published the dhss papers he discusses those three mechanisms <clears throat> and lists them more or less in a paper that I want you to have a look at and how they would be driven by higher resource prices. The first one, use less of the resource or increase resource efficiency. The second one, shift to substitute resources. They could be driven as well by changes in technology. The third one is all about the consumption side and social norms. Okay. 
So when Solo was just in this paper from 73, he didn't have any math and he was just talking about what might be important. He raised these mechanisms, among other things. When he had to do the math, he came up with something completely different, which was all about the idea that we could have more ovens, so to speak, increase capital. Note that to explain the past, we have to put those mechanisms into reverse, right? So why has resource use tracked GDP? It must be that resource efficient technology hasn't been developed. There hasn't been production on the product substitution on the production side away from certain inputs like and consumption patterns haven't shifted away from resource intensive goods. And we can learn about how these mechanisms work looking at historical data and then help use that to help us predict the future. What, how can we capture? We can't capture these using Cobb Douglas. What changes could we introduce? We'll talk about that in class. Why do you think Solo focused on the capital resource substitutability when he was doing the math, even though he focused on totally different things in when he was just writing an essay, so to speak. Well, it's all about the tractability and the, the, the mathematical methods and models he had available at the time. They were all about capital. We didn't know how to model growth and so on. So he just, or that's Gupta, he was Solo Stiglitz, they built a model the best they could with the methods they had. Unfortunately, it kind of led us in the wrong direction for many years. <coughs> okay, but now we've set the scene for unpacking the demand side for resources. We've, under, we've got an understanding of the supply side and we can see how um, the mechanisms to do with technological change and wages and so on affect supply. But the demand, we're gonna unpack the demand side and that's gonna be the focus of the next few lectures.